Hey guys, it's Jay Steven, and yeah, we're going to continue talking about the Northern Crusades. So the last couple podcasts I've done about the Northern Crusades, well, I've done a pretty basic overview of the Sword Brothers and the Teutonic Knights. These are the major uh, military orders that operated in the, the Northern Crusades and the Baltic Crusades. And what I want to look at now is the main history, the overview of the Livonian Crusade. So the Livonian Crusade is waged primarily by Germans and the Danes over the course of 1188 through 1300, roughly. And the origins of this effort it starts out with growing trade links between West German ports and Baltic ports, especially Bremen and Lübeck. Early on, there was this isolated little mission at the mouth of the Dvina Valley. It was led by a German canon by the name of Meinard. And the bishop, uh, the Archbishop Hartwig of Bremen, whose dates are 1185 to 1207, took an interest in this little mission and decided to make, uh, make Meinard the Bishop of Livonia and sort of up the game there in uh, what was the beginnings of Livonia in an attempt to establish uh, a strong Christian presence there at the mouth of the Dvina River. And the idea was to attract um, both uh, efforts from the church and also to attract Christian military power to the region, especially German military power, because, uh, of course, Hardwig himself was German, to start to solidify Christian control of this region. So early on, this early period in the 1180s through the 1190s, there were a lot of false starts. There were quite a few bishops, uh, several of whom were not very effective. One of them actually returned home, uh, convinced that the situation was hopeless. Uh, one was, in fact, killed during one of the sort of small crusades that was launched at this time, and he ended up sort of being a bit of a martyr in the preaching and the uh, promotion of, of crusading in this region. But um, the Archbishop of Bremen, Hartwig, he, he never really gave up, and he, he was committed to, to really kicking things into high gear here at the mouth of the Divina. And he envisioned a kind of ecclesiastical mission state, so much like what uh, the Teutonic state in Prussia was going to become. This is a, a church-run state, for the most part, that is going to be committed to the idea of converting the local population, the, the nearby pagan population, and transforming this region into a part of Latin Christendom. Now, early on, Archbishop Hartwig had the support of several key players. He had the support of King Valdemar of Denmark. He also had support from Philip of Swabia, who was the Hohenstaufen candidate for the contested German throne at the time. And, he, and probably most crucially, he had the support of Pope Innocent the third. So the most crucial development in Hartwig's campaign here was when his nephew, Albert, was named Bishop of Livonia, and Albert's dates are 1198 to 1229. Albert was going to prove to be the key figure in really getting the Livonian crusade off the ground. He was a hard-nosed Saxon bishop, and he was willing to really uh, take it to the next level in terms of recruitment and in terms of organizing this proto-Livonian state. He was aided in October of 1199 when Pope Innocent III issued a call for crusade in Livonia, and Albert launched the first ever crusade of his that was going to uh, that was going to arrive in Livonia and fight to conquer territory here. He, this uh, crusade was preached in Germany and Denmark in 1200, and Livonia was very much kind of developing into as, as a colony, uh, sort of a colony of, of Germany and an outpost of Latin Christendom. There was a lot of unrest in the German Empire at this time following the death of Emperor Henry VI. Uh, there was a lot of uh, infighting. This produced a lot of guilty consciences among Germans. 
the German nobility, and they were prime for a crusade to help assuage that. In 1204, Pope Innocent III granted Bishop Albert a perpetual crusade in Livonia. And if you'll remember from when we were talking about the Teutonic Knights last time, that was something that they got as well in their efforts in Prussia. And this proved to be a very effective model for the Baltic Crusades, and this was primarily because whoever was the local authority that was in charge of maintaining the territory conquered in the Northern Crusades, in this case in Livonia, at the start of the 13th century, we're looking at Bishop Albert. He um, needed the resources for pretty much a continual campaign, an annual campaign, because the model for these northern territories in which the Christian outposts were always in danger of being overwhelmed by the much more numerous local pagan tribes, the model was to recruit um, expeditions from, cru- from nearby crusaders, especially Germans, Uh, bring them in for the summer campaigns, and then when the Crusaders went home, the local garrisons would be able to hold the territory, hold the fortresses against against attacks and guerrilla tactics from the local pagans. So this idea that Bishop Albert could recruit Crusaders every single year, he had the indulgence ready to go for anybody who was willing to join up, This was enormously beneficial to his efforts. Over the course of the first 10 years, Albert subdued the pagan tribes on the coast and the lower Divina. He built a new capital at Riga, and of course this is where he gets his the name that he's known by to history, Bishop Albert of Riga, with a very substantial port to accommodate Western trade, which was very active and very important to the Livonian project, and he began building a cathedral. And probably most crucially, he established the Sword Brothers. And we've talked a lot about the Sword Brothers. Uh, I did an entire podcast on them recently. The Sword Brothers, of course, were a small order of brother knights loyal to Bishop Albert. In fact, he was, he was, uh, he was the authority to which they answered. And their purpose was to provide that garrison over once the uh, annual crusade departed. Um, you know, the, the Crusaders recruited for the summer campaign departed. The Sword Brothers would hold on to the fortresses that had been conquered along the river against attacks from the local uh, tribes. Now, the Sword Brothers, in their short life, developed a pretty bad reputation. They had a lot of enemies, and uh, one hostile chronicler described them as rich merchants banned from Saxony for their crimes who expected to live on their own without law or king. And this is kind of how their enemies tended to view them, as as insincere, you know, sort of mimicking a Knights Templar type order, but in fact really just a bunch of thugs who are out there on uh, the fringes of Christendom uh, in Livonia, uh, basically trying to uh, exploit the local population and local territory. Despite this, early on they appeared to be in line with uh, the church's crusading project in the region. They had the endorsement of the papacy early on. Later on, they would lose that. In fact, not much later on, but um, several members of Albert's own family became members of the Sword Brothers. One of the most prominent was uh, one of his relatives who was named Folkwin. Uh, Folkwin, in fact, became master of the Sword Brothers in 1209, when another brother called Wigbert killed the first master with an axe. So that just sort of should indicate to us what sort of guys these were. These were rough guys hanging out out there in these, uh, these drafty fortresses on the edge of Christendom. At the same time, there was a lot of activity from German merchants and tradesmen who were coming to the area to involve themselves in uh, the lucrative trade that was to be had at the port of Riga. And there were also some German landholders who were being settled in the newly conquered territory to help uh, Bishop Albert govern and uh, maintain the territory. And so these German merchants and landholders and then the Sword Brothers, this was the source. This was the source of Bishop Albert's power. The Sword Brothers probably never numbered more than around 120. As we discussed in the podcast about them, they were a very small organization. They did not have an international presence in Christendom. They did not have sponsorship outside of uh, Bishop Albert's personal leadership and patronage. They did not have a bunch of donators 
uh, throughout Christendom who were sending them uh, money, like the Teutonic Knights and Hospitallers and Knights Templar. And they were just, you know, a tiny, tiny organization in comparison to the three major military orders. Really, it's difficult to compare them at all. The Sword Brothers' primary duties in, uh, in Livonia were to organize crusaders when they came for the summer campaigns, and also to organize the indigenous levies. So that is, uh, throughout the Northern Crusades, the Christians enjoyed alliances with certain pagan groups. Uh, there, before the Christians ever arrived, these various pagan tribes were fighting each other. And so there were, there were old um, animosities that went very far back, old tribal animosities. And so the Christians were able to take advantage of this, and they were always able to organize indigenous groups to participate in the various campaigns that they conducted, these summer crusades, and the Sword Brothers helped to organize those. And of course, once the crusading was over for the season, uh, once the winter set in, their role was to hold the defensive positions there along the river. By 1209, Bishop Albert and his Livonian crusade had achieved a combination of subjugation and alliance from the Semigallians in the southwest of the river and the Letts, who exist, who dwelt towards the northeast. The Semigallians and the Letts primarily, they sought German assistance against their traditional enemies, who were the Lithuanians in the south and the Estonians in the north. So this is one of the reasons they were willing to strike an alliance with uh, Bishop Albert and his uh, sword brothers. The next phase of the, of the Livonian Crusade was the conquest of Estonia over the course of 1209 to 1218. During this time, Bishop Albert was able to subdue most of southern Estonia. However, once this period was over, he ran up against King Valdemar II of Denmark, who was campaigning in the north of Estonia and claimed overlordship of the territory. So in 1222, they were able to settle this conflict by establishing a partition. So basically this partition established that the Danes would control the north coast centered around their new fortress of Rival, which is now Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, in fact. Meanwhile, Bishop Albert would control the south, but under the overlordship of the Danes. One thing that began to develop over the course of Bishop Albert's Livonian project was sort of an, a built-in instability. Now, as you've probably noticed in our discussion here, there were a lot of competing claims on the region. For one thing, King Valdemar II wanted control of Estonia and uh, had an interest in the entire region. Danish shipping was vital to the Baltic trade. Meanwhile, there were the interests of the local German settlers in Livonia, who uh, really saw the project as um, sort of a very secular sort of thing. I mean, this was their livelihood. This was their, uh, you know, staking out uh, this territory for themselves. It was under the patronage of Bishop Albert, but nevertheless, their interests were very secular. Meanwhile, the Sword Brothers had their own interests, and in theory, they were a, a religious order that was interested in, uh, you know, establishing um, Christianity in the, in, in the region. But uh, they oftentimes operated much more like the, the, the local German uh, secular settlers. At the same time, Pope Innocent III viewed the entire enterprise as very much a church-directed and governed thing. Um, the secular interests were totally to be subordinated to that, in his, in his opinion. And finally, you've got the local pagan tribes, which are fighting each other and always ready to rebel against uh, Bishop Albert's rule. So... All of this kind of put together, you've got a pretty unstable situation. Meanwhile, the nature of the conquests themselves are pretty tenuous. Basically, the Dvina River acted as a lifeline connecting the various fortified positions along the river back to uh, the main um, base of Riga. The forests and the hinterland were dominated by the pagan tribes, and uh, raids from the heavily forested south especially were frequent, mainly conducted by the Lithuanians and Curonians. And they were much more numerous than the, the Sword Brother Garrison especially. And uh, they, these raids sometimes couldn't be resisted effectively. And um, 
they certainly couldn't be pursued deep into the forests. The Sword Brothers developed a system by which basically the way they would deal with these raids was that after the ambush was complete and they were the uh, the local pagan group was rushing off with a bunch of livestock, the Sword Brothers would attack them uh, hard and fast when they were still close to the fortress and when they were kind of encumbered by all this livestock that they'd gathered up and would, you know, kill as many of them as they could or, you know, break up their, their raiding party and hopefully uh, recapture some of the livestock. But but you can see how, how tenuous this could be, um, you know, especially during the, the long winter months when there weren't a bunch of crusaders there. The northern territory was more open, uh, more mountainous, and there were already well-worn invasion routes, which the Sword Brothers and the Crusaders could take advantage of during the summer campaigns. Uh, hill forts could control the territory, didn't necessarily have to be right on the river. Now, these forts that the Sword Brothers established were basically stone barracks for uh, men and horses, and they would have like a single watchtower. So they were pretty simple and stark affairs, you know, just basically a big stone building with a giant watchtower to, you know, kind of look for, for raids. Um, early on, the Sword Brothers used armor, catapults, crossbows to uh, overcome their incredible numerical disadvantage to the, to, to the local pagan groups. Of course, the, the heathen groups always had the advantage of numbers and experience with the local terrain. And later on, they began to use captured armor uh, that, that they took from uh, the enemy. And also, they, they began to purchase armor from uh, uh, Christians involved in the Baltic trade who were not above selling armor to non-Christians. There was, in fact, a papal ban against this, but not everybody followed it. Now, the government of the Sword Brothers was quite brutal. The local territory they were ruling was um, not always the, the most robust, and oftentimes they were uh, not able to get the sort of resources out of it that they wanted, and so they would try to make up for this by uh, trying to extract uh, heavier rents from the local population, and this often resulted in revolts. In fact, Pope Honorius III warned them against exploitation of the locals in 1222, which was a period of major revolt against the rule of the Sword Brothers. Interestingly enough, the Sword Brothers also were not above uh, engaging in warfare with neighboring Christian groups. They tried to seize Danish-held Estonia. A papal legate forced them to give that territory back to the Danes, but as soon as that legate headed, he, uh, returned home, <laughs> the Sword Brothers then recaptured uh, Danish lands in Estonia. And uh, they even began charging tolls on the Divina. So they really were not winning a lot of admirers across uh Across Christendom, they they did not have the high held reputation of groups like the Templars and Hospitallers. By 1230, in fact, the Sword Brothers were essentially uh, reviled, and uh, complaints were coming into Rome. The papacy was was beginning beginning to question whether or not it was worth it keeping this order in existence. There was an investigation by another papal legate, and he recommended that the papacy get rid of them and. Um, there was there was a legal hearing in Rome, and basically that's the direction that the Pope went with. Uh, they were going to suppress the order. Now, um, by this time, Bishop Albert had died and been replaced by a new bishop. Uh, Folkwin was still the master of the Sword Brothers, and he recognized that he was in a bad situation, and he tried to remedy it by uh, talking with the Teutonic Knights and getting them to accept his men as a part of their order. The Teutonic Knights, in response to this, sent um, some brothers to inspect the Sword Brothers and their fortresses and their way of life. And these brothers went back to their order. Uh, they went back to a general meeting and reported that the Sword Brothers were in, had basically abandoned their rule. They were no longer living by their rule at all. And they were pretty much just committed to, um, to secular um, ends, uh, power, wealth, um, 
personal uh, aggrandizement, basically. So they were pretty much a, a fraudulent order at this point. They were they were not um, they were not in in any way adhering to the lifestyle of a military order. So while the papacy was in the process of trying to dissolve the Sword Brothers, there was a campaign in which uh, Master Folkwin and a group of crusaders who'd arrived for the seasonal campaign decided to attack Lithuania. This resulted in the famous Battle of Sol, in which the Lithuanians totally defeated um, the Sword Brothers and basically wiped them out. Uh, Folkwin himself was killed. Um, many, many Sword Brothers were killed, and this essentially uh, put an end to the order. So um, the Lithuanians did the job for the Pope you could say. Along with this, there followed general upheaval in the Livonian state, and the Teutonic Knights and the King of Denmark stepped in to kind of save the project. The King of Denmark uh, was, was granted Estonia and uh, came to an agreement with the Teutonic Knights about this. Uh, the Teutonic Knights were much easier to get along with for him than the Sword Brothers had been. And... Um, and so the Danes were going to control Estonia. Meanwhile, the Teutonic Knights set about reestablishing Christian control of Livonia. And they, they succeeded in doing this through a combination of military strength, uh, well-thought-out alliances with the various uh, pagan groups, but also tolerance of their client pagan tribes. They came to fair terms with the Curonians, Semigalians, and Samagodians, these groups ended up accepting baptism, but they got to govern themselves and maintain their own fortresses. Now, there was a major revolt again in 1259 and 1260, in which uh, much of the structure of uh, Teutonic-held Livonia was overturned. There was widespread rebellion among most of the pagan tribes. The Teutonic Knights suffered some serious defeats in battle. Nevertheless, unlike the Sword Brothers, as we mentioned, actually, in the last podcast, the Teutonic Knights had the international infrastructure that uh, these major defeats did not wipe them out. Uh, they had fundraising throughout Europe. They were able to reestablish uh, strong military uh, forces in the area, even after serious defeats. And over, over the course of the rest of the century, basically, they fought back hard to uh, reestablish control of Livonia and to secure control of Livonia. The Curonians were completely subdued by 1263. The Semigallians never fully subdued. Most of their nobles were killed by the Teutonic Knights while their common people fled to Lithuania. But basically by 1290, the Teutonic Knights had stabilized uh, Livonia. Uh, the, the, the project of, uh, of a Christian-ruled Livonia was achieved. There was a frontier along uh, the territory of the Lithuanians, and this, in fact, set the stage for a long-term hostility between the Teutonic Order and the Lithuanians, which was going to last into the 15th century. However, the, the price of, this, uh, of the Teutonic um, domination of Livonia was just incredible uh, violence and devastation and the loss of a lot of life. Uh, this was a very hard-fought and brutal period of warfare over the course of the close of the 13th century. Um, but again, I mean, this this did result in in success in the way that the Sword Brothers had ultimately failed. So it was it was a hard won and uh, brutally won success. Uh, indeed, the Livonian branch of the Teutonic Order was going to continue to exist until 1562. And so that, my friends, is going to be my overview of the Livonian Crusade. Uh, the phases, which you know, begin with uh, the Sword Brothers, who basically existed as an order under the authority of the Archbishop of Riga, and into the period of the rule of the Teutonic Knights, during which time the Teutonic Knights essentially had uh, total sovereign control over the Livonian project, over the Livonian territory that, that was won in that theater of crusading. So this is a major um, point over the course of, of the Baltic Crusades. Now, what I want to talk about next time is uh, another major project of the Teutonic Knights, that is the Prussian Crusade. This is another major front of the Northern Crusades, so we're going to look at that next time in a podcast. 
And I do want to uh, let you guys know that I'm not going to be uploading much next week. In fact, possibly I won't be able to upload at all next week simply because I'm going to be out of town and not have much access to um, to recording equipment and probably not a lot of attention a lot of time to do it. So, so I will miss uh, getting to talk to you guys, but, um, you know, I'll be back at it, um, uh, at normal schedule, uh, the following week. So hope everybody's doing well. And I hope you guys enjoyed this, uh, little look at the Livonian crusade. I think it's very fascinating history indeed. And I'll talk to you soon.